Hi everyone, Mr. Lee here. In this video, we're going to go over Unit 4, the conservation of energy, work, and power. All right, so how we should start off is this idea of work. Okay, so for us here in physics, work has a very specific definition, and this entire unit is revolving around this idea of work. So the first thing that we were introduced to was the equation for work. So we know that work is equal to force times the, the displacement. And um, if you remember, we added a little cosine of theta. So what that cosine of theta just simply means is that your force and the motion or the displacement, they should be in a parallel uh, axis to each other in order for work to be done. So what that means is if we have uh, force and displacement that are perpendicular to each other, that means no work is being done. Only uh, if your force and your displacement are parallel to each other, that is when work is being done. Right here, no work. Right there, all kinds of good work. Okay, so before we move on, let's do a couple of quick review ideas with work. So if we were to have a box and we were to drag this box along the x-axis uh, with a, let's say, a angled force, and we'll call this angled force tension, uh, if I were to draw a free body diagram, I would draw a normal force going up. I would draw the force of gravity going down. Uh, and let's say there's a little bit of force of friction right here, force of friction. Okay, So that would be the free body diagram. Um, now taking a look at this, we can break down this angled force even more because we know that anytime we have a, uh, a force at an angle, we can break it down as these components. So we have Tx. And this vertical one, we can call this ty. All right, so if we know that this object is moving along the x-axis, that means only the x-forces is doing work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight the forces that are in the x-axis, and that will tell us if it's doing work or not. This force of friction, because that's along the x-axis, that's doing work. This t sub x, that's doing work. Notice how here, not all of the tension is doing work, only um, a portion of the tension, uh, which we can say that this will be the T uh, cosine of theta, okay? Only a fraction of the tension is actually doing work. Uh, compared to Ty, that's not doing work. F of N, not doing work, and F of G, not doing work. Okay, so this was a, a brief example of how work uh, can be shown for an object moving along a, a axis. Okay. So the big idea here is that work can be done if and only if um, it's, it follows and it meets these two requirements. And once again, this cosine of theta, that just tells us if it's parallel. Okay, so from there, uh, we took a look at force position kinds of graphs. Now, here's something that you should have down in your head. Uh, within the equation, so we have W is equal to F times delta X. Um, if the two variables, if your y and your x variables are multiplied um, to each other, then that means that you're looking for the area under the curve. So for example, if I have, uh, let's say something that looks like this, right? I get something that looks like this, boom. What this means is that uh, if we were to break this uh, into two sections, so we can call this section one, and over here we can call this section two. The total amount of work that was done by whatever created this graph, uh, right here in section one, this is what we can call positive work. Now we're gonna um, tie this idea of work with energy. So what this means is that whatever this force is, it could be you know the force of gravity, it could be F1, F2, tension, we just don't know, right? But whatever this force is, from uh, position zero to whatever this position is, position x1, okay? While it was moving from zero to x1, positive work was being done. Energy was given. So that's what we're gonna try to focus on here. How can we tie in work with energy? And if we take a look over here, in that shaded region, whatever that area is, this, because it's below the x-axis, that's negative work. So this, we can say that energy uh, was taken away in whatever form that might be. 
Okay, and then once we're going over the, the energy portion of this unit, we'll, we can take a, a deeper dive into that. All right, so the first equation that we came across was the work equation. Now, if you remember, the second equation that we came across was the power equation. We haven't really done much with power, but simply put, power is uh, work over time or the change in energy over time. It's how quickly uh, you're able to work or how quickly you're able to change uh, forms of energy in a amount of time. And the units for that would be the watt. Okay? And so oftentimes you hear about the, the light bulb, and the light bulb um, is able to use energy and produces light. And the power rating of the light bulbs is in watts. That's where it came from. Okay. All right. So other than the equation, there's not really too much to talk about. The only thing that you should really know is that power uh, and work and time, you need to know how the variables relate to each other. So let's take a look at this. We have power, work, and time. Um, now, how you should approach the, uh, the variables in the relationship is take a look at where it's currently located. Okay, so we have power over one, and I'm, I'm gonna say that's over one because that's over a denominator of one, and if it's over a denominator of one, it's just itself, so it's just power. Okay, so the relationship between power and work. Uh, the way I like to imagine it is, one, is it on opposite sides of the equal sign? And the answer is yes, right? And so that means that it's directly proportional. Now, another way you could take a look at this is if we were to make each and every single one of these variables numerically one so we have power is work over time and so we can say power is one work is one and time is one right one divided by one gives us one the way we know if it's directly proportional or not is if we were to change one of the variables so for example if i were to change power to be two okay and we're taking a look at the relationship between uh power and work so i'm gonna i'm not gonna change time at all two is equal to blank over one and the numerator has to be 2, right? 2 divided by 1 gives us 2. So because both of these increase by a factor of 2, we can say it's directly proportional. So this is the first proportion. Let's try the next proportion. Uh, what about power and time? So if I take a look here, if I know that power and work are directly proportional, um, because both are in the numerator, and I see that time here is in the denominator, when you have something in the denominator, we can say that it is inversely proportional. Okay, inversely proportional because one is in the denominator, or well, in this case it was time. But see what I do here. If I were to ask you what is the relationship between power and one over time, okay? Now this is something cool because if I were to take a look at this, I'm looking at power as a whole and I'm looking at one over time as a whole. Because they are all on opposite sides of the equal sign, we can say that this relationship right here will be directly proportional. Proportional. Okay. So what that means is that if we were to graph it, um, we would just get a linear line. All right. So see the difference here. Um, power versus time, because we're not taking a look at one over time, but just the time value itself. We can say it's inversely proportional according to this power equation. But if we're taking a look at the variable as one over the time, um, because that's how it's actually represented within the equation, we can say that it's directly proportional. And also it's on the opposite sides of the equation. All right. And the last one that we can take a look at is the relationship between work and time. All right. Now, let me show you a quick little trick. So we know that power is equal to work over time, and we want to see what the relationship is between work and time, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides by time to get power times time is equal to work. So in this case here, uh, we can see that time and work are on opposite sides of the equal sign. Therefore, we have a directly proportional relationship. Okay. Um, and in order to prove this, let's use the number technique. All right, so we have power is equal to work over time. And let's make everything one. One is equal to one divided by one. Now, uh, I'm gonna increase work by a factor of two. So two divided by what value will give us one? And the answer is two. Two divided by two gives us one. So we know that if we increase um, power, 
work by a factor of two, we also increase time by a factor of two, and this is a directly proportional relationship. All right, cool. All right, so we had the relationships there. Now let's move on to the e energy. How can we relate work and energy? Now, this is one of those conceptual things. This unit is full of these conceptual ideas. Work is equal to the change in energy. Now, what this means is if work is done to a system, energy must change. Okay, energy must change. Now we're gonna take a really deep dive into this because this is probably like the end all be all statement right here for this entire unit. And it links with the conservation of energy uh, theorem, which states that the energy for a system cannot change. The total amount of energy for a system cannot change. It can only be transferred from one form to another. So we're gonna take a look at that statement and the statement that I just wrote uh, a little bit more in depth. But first off, let's take a look at the different kinds of energy that we discovered. So first off, capital U, this means potential, okay? Uh, sometimes you might see it written as PE, uh, but that's, you know, that's physical education in my book, so I'm gonna use U for potential energy, because you know, that makes sense. Um, and from there we have U sub G. So this is the gravitational, gravitational potential energy, and then we have U sub S. Now, I'm going to break down U sub G first. So gravitational potential energy is equal to the mass times the acceleration due to gravity times the height. Now, we often say that here on Earth, the gravitational potential energy is the energy that is height dependent. Okay, It's height dependent. Um, and if we were to take a look at U sub S, this is the spring potential equation. And we say that U sub S is equal to 1 half kx squared. Now I'm going to go, I want to go into this a little bit more. k is what we call the spring constant. Okay, k is the spring constant. So it tells us how stiff a spring is, or how loose a spring is, or how spring-like that spring is. And x, x is the uh, displacement from the resting position. Okay. So x is a displacement from a resting position. So what this means is, let's say we have a we have a wall and we have like a spring attached to the wall. If I were to, so I'm going to draw a dotted line. So this is the resting position. If I were to pull on the spring, so it's stretched out, this right here from this middle resting position to how far out I stretched, that will be considered to be the spring extension. Okay, so that would be my x. And if I were to push on the spring, so the distance from here to where it would have been resting, that is my spring compression, that's my x. So it works both ways. Um, now, here's something cool about springs. Springs uh, is the, basically it's the third law in action. So if you pull on a spring, what the spring's gonna do is it's gonna push back on you. And vice versa, if you push on the spring, uh, the spring will always you know, push back in the opposite direction. It's a really cool thing. All right, um, so this is the displacement from the resting position, um, and this can also change. So for example, if I had a, if I had a spring, all right, that's with nothing on it, and then I do a spring with like a object. So this right here, so figure one, that's with no object, and right here is figure two. This is with an object. So we can say, like, if, if this is our system, and the system consists of spring uh, plus mass, okay, we can say that at this location right here, that is its resting position. Versus if we were to just take a look at the spring and the spring alone, okay, no mass, we can say right there at that point, that is your resting position. So it's all in perspective, okay? All right, so from there, uh, we have two types of potential energy, um, and we are going to also expand on our other type of energy. We have capital K for kinetic energy. Now, sometimes you might see me write it as KE, and, you know, that makes sense because that's how you spell kinetic energy, right? With the K and with the E. Um, and the equation for kinetic energy is one-half mass times the velocity squared. Now, 
we say that kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So within a problem, if you see that an object is moving, it has kinetic energy. Um, and that is something that you should definitely get down memorized in your brain. Now, the types of questions that you might see is uh, they'll ask you how the energy might change based upon the, the variable that's changing. So for example, and this is, this is one that they really, really like to do. They say if you double the velocity, with uh, what magnitude will the kinetic energy change? So if I take a look at the equation, k equals 1 half mv squared, what a lot of students want to do is they just uh, want to just put in m and then 2v, or 2 right there, and they'll just square the v, okay? And this is wrong, because the velocity that we're changing is the entire velocity amount, so that's 2v, and the entire velocity has to be squared. So if you remember, um, when we see how our variables relate to each other, we always want to get rid of the variables that we're not actually changing or taking a look at. So in terms of k equals 1 half mv squared, I just want to see the relationship between velocity and kinetic energy. Therefore, I can get rid of the 1 half and the mass because I'm not changing that. Okay. So if we double the velocity, we get 4v squared is equal to ke. Okay? And we know that ke is equal to v squared, so I could just substitute in that v squared with ke. And so I get 4 times the ke. So if we increase the velocity by a factor of 2, the kinetic energy increases by a factor of 4. And what we can call that is, um, we can call that the square relationship. Okay? The square relationship. And if you take a look, uh, we'll go back up, but if you take a look at the uh, spring potential energy equation, we can see that um, the potential energy of a spring also has a square relationship with the compression, right? Okay, so we have these three forms of equations, um, and all both uh, of those equations can be found under what we call mechanical energy. Now, I want to highlight here mechanical energy because that is often how the total energy of a system is described, mechanical energy. You, you won't always come across the term total energy, but mechanical energy, that, that exists. Okay? And u sub g, u sub s, and ke are all forms of mechanical energy. Okay? Okay. So if we're taking a look at this uh, statement, if work is done to a system, energy must change. Um, I want to actually go into that statement with, with a scenario. Alrighty? So this idea of a system, probably within this entire review, this is, the, this is one of the most important ideas that you uh, should walk away with. Right? So I'm going to give you a, a, a quick scenario. So I have a ball. Okay. I have a ball, and this ball, we're going to drop it, and it's going to hit the floor. Okay. Now, if I were to say the system is the ball and the earth, okay. the system is the ball and the earth, um, and if we were to do a practice problem, or if we were to solve something for this, uh, we can say that initially this ball had gravitational potential energy, and as the ball is falling, all of that gravitational potential energy, if it hits the floor, of course, will turn into kinetic energy, right? And this becomes our equation. Now, if I were to ask you, was work done? Okay, was work done? Um, you have to first ask yourself, well, were there any outside forces? Were there any outside forces? Was there anything pushing or pulling on this object that is not a part of the system? Because remember, if you're part of the system, you cannot exert a force or you cannot do work on yourself. Okay, both apply because work is force times displacement. Um, and what a lot of students want to say was, yeah, of course, work was being done. The force of gravity pulled the ball down. But we can't say that because the earth is part of the system. Okay, so what that means is that this earth right here that's pulling on uh, this ball, and vice versa, by the way, Newton's third law, uh, we can say that the earth did not do work on the ball, 
um, because it's part of the system, right? It just went from gravitational potential energy and the energy transformed itself into kinetic energy down here. All right, now see how all of this, see how the narrative changes when I say the system is just the ball, okay? When it's just the ball. All right, so if the system is just the ball, we're not looking at the Earth at all. So we just have basically a floating ball. Okay, we just have a ball floating in space. Now, as I say space, we just have a ball just floating there. We don't know where the Earth is, but we know it's there, right? Um, because the system is just a ball. If we were to drop the ball, we're not taking a look at the Earth, but we drop the ball, the ball's just going to do what it's normally going to do. It's going to fall, right? It's going to fall towards the Earth. But now, if the question is, was work done on the ball, we can say yes, work was done on the ball. I'm going to do a dramatic pause there. Okay, work was done to the ball, and that is because um, if we were to look for evidence, we would say because there was a change in energy. How do you know there was a change in energy? Well, if we were to just look at a ball just floating there, currently the energy is zero. It has zero joules of energy, right? And we can't say it has potential energy because we're not taking a look at the Earth. We're not taking a look at the floor. But as the, the ball gets pulled towards the ground, what does it gain? Very good. It gains kinetic energy because that's just because it's it's moving. So that is the change in energy. So what caused this change in energy? And that would be um, the force of gravity, right? The force of gravity did work on the ball. And uh, so if we were to take a look at the equation, work is equal to force times displacement, right? And we can say that it was a force of gravity that moved this ball over a displacement. And we should take a look at this, right? We know force of gravity is mass times the acceleration due to gravity times the displacement. Now, because it was falling, we can rewrite this as mgh because it fell a vertical distance. So we can say that the work that was done by the force of gravity, it's equivalent to the potential energy that it would have had if we were to look at the Earth. And so if we were to write out this equation, super cool, by the way, how it all works out. I get it? It works out. Um, we can say in the beginning, it had no mechanical energy, but in the end, it gained kinetic energy. Right? And so what we can do now is we can uh, add in work to this equation. And we can add in work because now we have an outside force affecting the mechanical energy. So we can say work, oh boy, work plus zero mechanical energy is equal to kinetic energy. And if we just get rid of the zero, we can say that the work that was done turned into the object's kinetic energy. Okay. Um, and in this case, we can substitute in this equation right there, and we can say that mgh is equal to the kinetic energy. And would you look over here? Look at this. We say that the potential, gravitational potential energy, that's what mgh is, is equal to kinetic energy. And that's what we said from the beginning. So it all depends on what you're looking at within the system. Okay. So let's do a little a quick sidebar highlighting notes there. Okay. So we can say that if Earth is not a part of the system. Earth can do work on the object. Okay. All right, so let's take a, a look at a, a different scenario. All right, um, let's say we have a we have a scenario like this, right? We have a we have a box, um, and this is this is all very rough. This is this is a rough surface. There's friction involved. Okay, so we have a box here, and it's moving to the right, and eventually uh, it goes up here. It's moving, but it's like very slow up here. But it does raise itself up to like a height. All right. So in this scenario here, if we were to come up with the equation, or I guess before we start, we got to ask ourselves. Was work being done? Okay, we're there outside forces. And because we're looking at the force of friction, uh, we can say yes, the force of friction, uh, because 
the system here would just be like the box earth ramp. Okay, so we're looking at the box, the earth, and the ramp. Okay, so that is our system. Um, and we know that was being done because there was a change in energy. And let me show you exactly what I mean. So we can start off with the equation ME is equal to ME uh, plus the work. All right? Um, now, in the beginning, it was moving, so we can say that it had kinetic energy. And at the end, it was moving, but you know, not as fast. Um, and it was raised up a height. So we have an equation that looks like this. Now, if there is a force of friction, then we can say that the energy was lost. Okay? And we say that negative work was being done. And that's because the force of friction is going to be slowing down this object and it's going to turn some of that kinetic energy into heat. Now, this is, um, this is something cool. We always say that heat is wasted energy. Um, we can actually use heat. Once it's out in the universe, it's gone. And this is how we can know. So if you get your hands and you, you rub your hands together, right? So right now, what's forming between my hands is heat. Now, the only reason why I'm able to do this action was because I had food earlier, and the, the calories from the, the food is supplying my muscles with the energy that it needs, and from the energy that, I'm going to stop doing that, and the energy that it needs uh, gets transformed into heat, right? And I can feel it, right? My, my, my hands are pretty warm. But once, once that heat leaves my hand, and it you know, heats up the molecules in my room, once it's there, we say that we can never get that energy back. And so we always say that the, the heat energy is always going to be taken away from the system. It can never add to the system. It always takes away, right? Um, and so we get an equation that looks something like this. Uh, negative work plus kinetic energy initial is equal to kinetic energy final plus the gravitational potential energy. So this is how we can uh, say that yes, the conservation of energy, it's, it's true, right? We, by the way, the conservation of energy is the total energy initial is equal to the total energy final. And the only way that this can change is if there are outside forces and we call that work. So this is the, this is the equation that we wanna use. Let me clean this up a little bit here. That, <clears throat> so this is the conservation of energy equation plus work, there we go. Work plus the mechanical energy initial is equal to the mechanical energy final, all right? So if I were to take a look at this scenario again, but I wanna change the system, okay? I wanna change the system. So let's say that the system is just the, the box and the ramp, okay? We're gonna acknowledge that the ramp exists um, and let's say there is no earth. Okay. So we have the box here and it's moving, same scenario. Um, but let's say, uh, let's say it's a smooth surface. I don't want to add too many variables. So it's a smooth surface, so no friction, no mu. Okay. So in this equation here, we can say that the mechanical energy initial is equal to the mechanical energy final, um, plus the work. Now, if we take a look here, plus work, the initial energy, because this object is moving here and here, the initial energy is going to be the kinetic energy. But we gotta think about this conceptually. As the box moves from its lower position down here to its higher position up here, what's gonna happen with the kinetic energy? Is it going to increase or decrease? Very good. Because it rised up a height, it's going to slow down a little bit, okay? So we can say kinetic energy final. And so the kinetic energy final is not going to be as big. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Mr. why aren't you writing gravitational potential energy on the other side? Well, that's because we're not taking a look at the Earth as a system, okay? So if I were to take a look at this equation right here, we can see that the work plus the kinetic energy is equal to the kinetic energy final. So in this case here, because the, uh, the object moved upwards, but the force of gravity is pulling it downwards, this work would be negative work because the force and the direction is going the opposite direction. So we can say the work done by, I'm gonna say work done by the, the gravity, 
right, um, is doing negative work to the entire system and the energy is taken away. And what was that form of energy? It was the kinetic energy. So if you remember, we can say that work is equal to the change in energy. And if we were to take a look at just the box and the ramp, no earth, we know there was a change in energy because our kinetic energy final was less than the kinetic energy initial. Therefore, work was being done. And in fact, it was negative work that was being done. All right. So to um, tie this idea back up with the force times displacement graph, which is over here, uh, we can now say, like, if you were to be given a force times displacement graph like we see uh, in front of us, um, we should be able to uh, combine the ideas that we just discussed, right, this positive work and this negative work, to first off say that um, that there was a outside force, okay, and remember this outside force is never a part of the system, so a lot of the times over here in the red, that's like the force of friction, um, but as we just saw, it could also be the force of gravity, um, and energy decreases, so in the red, we could write the equation like so, uh, negative work plus mechanical energy initial is equal to mechanical energy final. Um, and this blue region we can say is positive work plus mechanical energy initial is equal to mechanical energy final. All right. So if I were to like give you a big idea, right, these highlighted ideas, I would say whenever the problem is talking about a system such as box, earth, ramp, or I don't know, in this case it was just uh, the ball, right, or ball in the earth. Pay very close attention to them, okay? So if the problem is talking about a very specific object or item, and uh, within the problem you see that there's other items or other objects interacting with that one object in the system, chances are your mechanical energy will be changing, okay? So if I say it one more time, if you look at a problem and you see that the object or the system is interacting with other objects that are not in the system, chances are your mechanical energy will change. Um, and that's the only time that work is being done to the system. So the system's energy can either increase uh, or decrease. Okay? All right. Um, with that being said, I think that will wrap up our review for the conservation of energy unit. Uh, pay close attention to the system. Um, and remember, it's, it's a fundamental law. It is very important to how energy moves throughout our entire universe. Um, and so there's heavy emphasis on energy. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.